Good evening, and thank you for uh, everyone to, for joining us uh, for tonight's program, Machloket, One Torah with Many Opinions, the second in a series of webinars on Masora and Machloket with Dr. Yardena Osban. Uh, please note this program is being recorded. Also, everyone is muted, but we welcome questions and comments in the chat, and we'll do our best to address them uh, during the webinar. Uh, my name is Noah Gradowski. I'm a board member of UTJ and also one of the moderators of our Facebook discussion group. If you're on uh, Facebook, please join us uh, for a great discussion there. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this webinar series, including our partners, Rabbi Gerald and Benita Nathan Sussman, in celebration of their grandson, Ozzy Vidan's Bar Mitzvah, and our friends, Mitch Morrison, in celebration of Dr. Osman's professional and spiritual contributions, continuing the wisdom of her beloved father, Allah Shalom, and Leonard Shabasan, uh, in memory of all of his relatives who are lost in the Shoah. I'd like to say a few words about UTJ uh, for those of you who are new uh, to UTJ programs. The Union for Traditional Judaism is a group of rabbis, scholars, and lay people who advocate for a passionate, open-minded approach to Torah study and observance of Jewish law, halakha, rooted in classical religious sources and informed by modern scholarship. Our philosophy is distinguished by the symbiotic relationship between faith in God's given Torah and intellectual integrity, and our emphasis on the sacred framework of halakha as our unifying guide. I'd also like to let everyone know about some of our upcoming programs. Uh, the third in the series of webinars with Dr. Osband was scheduled for next Monday, uh, but it will be rescheduled, so please stay tuned uh, for the date. Uh, we also have a webinar titled Exploring Traditional Jewish Perspectives on Physician-Assisted uh, Death, a Case Study with Rabbi Dr. David Novak and Rabbi Dr. Lila Kashdan this Thursday morning at 10 a.m. And we have a pre-Yom Kippur class with Rabbi Stephen Sachs titled Making Up with Dearly Departed Ones, How Do Jewish Views on Life After Death Affect the Way We Approach Yom Kippur? on Monday, September 13th at 7 p.m. Uh, I'll put all the information uh, about those webinars and how to uh, register for them into the chat right now. Uh, and then I would uh, finally, and most importantly, like to introduce our speaker this evening, and then I'll turn it over to her. Uh, Yardana Osband, MD, and this is an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics at New York Medical College in Valhalla, New York. Yardana studied for two years in Madras at Lindenbaum and received her BA in Jewish Studies and Music at Yeshiva University, Stern College for Women. Yardana attended medical school at the Sackler School for Medicine and completed her residency in pediatrics at the Maria Ferreri Children's Hospital in Valhalla, New York. Yardana has taught in many schools, synagogues, and has been a scholar in residence in many communities. She lectures on Tanakh, Halakha, and Talmud, with a specific interest in the biographies of the Tanaim and Amoraim. She is also a co-host of the Daf Yomi uh, podcast, Talking Talmud. Yardena also serves on the board of ORA, the Organization for Resolution of Agunot, the Riverdale Minion, and is the founder of the Orthodox Leadership Project. She and her family also started the Michael E. Osband Senior Slav Campaign uh, with Gift of Life. Yardena currently resides in New York with her husband and children. With that, I'd like to thank Dr. Asman for being with us uh, for these uh, series of webinars and turn the podium over to her. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. And I, I'll put a plug in for your Thursday morning um, uh, lecture because uh, Professor Kajdan is a close friend of mine and a colleague of mine at New York Medical College. We do a lot of teaching together. Um, so I'm sure it will be a great program. Um, so for those of you who joined us uh, last week, and for those of you who are new this week, um, today what I want to explore a little bit is the concept of machlokas. Last week, we talked a lot about the idea of transmission, and particularly the way that transmission or misora is presented in the first parak of Perkei Avot. And it's really sort of this linear transmission, which goes from generation to generation. And we sort of concluded by saying that, yes, there are some changes that can happen within generation, generation to generation, but the essence of the Torah itself, uh, of the Torah Shabal Peh, 
tends to be the same. And so I think this leads us to an interesting question, which is where does machlokas actually come from? Um, and how did we get to a Torah that does have machlokas in it? And what's the purpose of machlokas? And can, we, can there be something productive from machlokas itself? And so what I wanna start with is here is this first source that's in Shemot. This is during the giving of the Torah itself in Matan Torah, chapter 19, verse eight, which has vayinu kol ha'am yachdav, right? The whole nation answers together after receiving the Torah. Vayomiru kol asher diber Hashem nasa, vayeshev Moshe dibre ha'am el Hashem. So they say all the words that Hashem has spoken, we will do, and Hashem reports that back. But the key here is the vayanu kol ha'am yachdav. Everybody answers together. Everybody heard the same thing, and they answer back together. And so I think this pasuk sort of is part of our question here. How is it that we get to, that we know, right? I mean, it's basically, you know, the punchline of so many Jewish jokes that you have two jokes, you know, two Jews in a room with three opinions. Machloka seems to be part of our natural culture. And as I mentioned before, this first mission in Perkei Avos, which we learned together last week, right? Which has this very linear type of transmission of Misora, Moshe Ki Bel Torah, Misinai, Umasra, Yoshua. Yeshua lezekenim, uzekenim lenevim, unevim asru laanche knesset agdola, right? So we sort of have, it just goes from generation to generation, very easy way of transmitting. And so then where does machlokas get in? How is it possible that we could have a variety of opinion? So the first thing I wanna go through is where is the first machlokas that we know about? One of the things that we talked about last week is that within the first parak of Perkei Avot, we go from anche knesset agdola, to the last of Anshei Knesset Adzgodola, which is Shimon Atzadik. And then we go to Antigonish Yish Soho, who's the next generation. And after that, we go to five uh, generations, which are pairs. They're called the Zugot, the most famous of which is Hillel and Shammai. And according to the Mishnah in Chagiga, this is really sort of the first machlokas that we ever see. This is the oldest known machlokas. And the Mishnah reads this file, Yosi ben Yoezer Omer, Shaloli Smoch, Yossi ben Yochanan Omer Lismoch. So essentially what this uh, machlokas is over is when someone brings the korban chagiga on a Yom Tov, right? That is the celebratory korban that you bring. So often when we bring korbanos, we have to lay our hands on the korban. That's the idea of, that's literally where the word smicha actually comes from. Um, and some of the ideas is that you're sort of transferring yourself as a person onto this animal that's going to be sacrificed. And the question is, can you do smicha on Yom Tov or is it an issue of the animal being muksa and you can't actually do smicha on the animal itself? It's a very interesting machlokas and how it's, but the point here is just to see that this is where the machlokas starts. So we know that with each of the zugot, as we talked about last week, the first in the zug was the nasi, the second in the zug was the av beitin. And so here we see with each of these pairs, of these five generations of Zugot, there's a machlokas over this issue. So Yossi ben Yoezer says, you don't do smicha on the Korban Chagiga. Yossi ben Yochanan says, you do. Second generation, Yoshua ben Parchi Omer Shaloli Smoch, not Tai Har Bailey Omer Li Smoch. Then we get to the third generation, Yehuda ben Tabai Omer Shaloli Smoch, Shimon ben Shetach Omer Shaloli Smoch. Right? Fourth generation, Shmaya Omer Li Smoch, Abtalion Omer Shaloli Smoch. And then we get to the fifth generation. Now, the fifth generation is always the most famous generation. It's Hillel and Shammai. But yet this Mishnah teaches us something very interesting. Hillel umenachem lo nechleku. So originally it was not Hillel and Shammai. It was actually Hillel and Menachem. And they actually did not disagree with each other. Yatsa Menachem nichnas Shammai. Menachem leaves though as part of the pair and Shammai comes in. Shammai omer shalol smoch. And yet again, what happens in this generation there's again Machlokas and Shammai disagrees with Hillel's opinion and he says, we do not do smicha. Hillel omer li smoch. Harishonim hayu nasiim bishnayim lahem avo beitim. So the first in each pair is the nasi and the second one is the av beitim. So now we won't get into exactly who this Menachem person is, but it basically there's a couple of different traditions about what happened to him, either that he was sort of conscri conscripted to a non-Jewish army or he actually became a heretic of some sort. But it's interesting to see that sort of in these five generations of Zugot, the only machlokas that we see is one that is about smicha. And then we have here a Talmud Yerushalmi 
that talks more explicitly about this idea of machloket. And it says the following, So in the beginning, there was no machloket about anything except about this issue of smicha. And then Hillel and Shammai come along, they end up having four different machlokot. I won't get into what they are. There's different opinions about what they are exactly, but they essentially also disagreed. They expanded machloket from one to now they expanded it to two. Misha Rabu Tamide Beit Shammai Utamide Beit Hillel. But from the time of when there was increased the number of students of Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, the Loshim Shu at Rabbeim called Sarchan. And they did not, you know, Shamish, Shimshu is sort of this very Jewy word, but it sort of means like they were not attentive to their rabbis. They were not attentive to their teachers, to their needs. The Rabu HaMachlokot Yisrael. So what happened? Now more Machlokot actually increased. The Nechleku L'Shtei Kitot Elu, right? The Nechleku L'Shtei Kitot. And they basically became two different camps, two different schools of thought. One would say something was tahor, the other would say something was tameh. And it will not go back to the way that it should have been until Ben David comes, which means basically until uh, Mashiach actually comes. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's very interesting to see that essentially, according to this Talmud Yerushalmi, Machlokas is not a good thing. It's a very bad thing. And really, the Tal Yerushalmi gives a specific reason for why it happens. And it's basically because of Loshim Shu at Rabbeim Kolt Sarchan. There was something about their students that they did not pay close enough attention to their teachers, right? Maybe they weren't careful enough about what their teachers were actually teaching or how they were teaching it, or the respect that maybe Hillel and Shammai had for each other. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But basically, because of that character flaw, they ended up with these shtei tot, these two different sort of groups, right? And they would always be opposite of each other. Elu mitamim, the elu mitarim. One would say it was tame, and one would say it was tahor. And the Yerushalmi goes on to say that this basically won't be fixed until when, until Mashiach, uh, you know, until Mashiach comes. And then it's interesting to say that Rabbi Chia ends with another interesting statement here. Rabbi Chia b'shem Rabbi Shmal says, don't think that this issue of shvut, which is the essential issue of the machlokas over smicha, right? Don't think that this is just a, a kala, like it's a, it's a little thing that they're arguing about. This was really a big issue and caused machlokas le'olam forever. And so I think what he's trying to say here a little bit is that we may look at an issue and be like, all right, so there's a little difference of opinion. But here, what they're coming to say is, no, even a thing that looks like a kala, it could be the nechla kuala avot alam, right? This could be something that our ancestors have deep, deep disagreement about forever. It's not clear if this last statement is a criticism, if it's more just a matter of fact, um, but it seems to be saying, right, that this is something that, that our ancestors, our avot, were always involved with, that there was always machloket of some sort. So now that we have this idea from the Yerushalmi that machloket is not necessarily a good thing, it was maybe caused uh, by the students of uh, Hillel and Shammai, I want to look at a few Mishnahs from Masachat Ejot. So Masachat Ejot is a very interesting Masachat. We'll, we'll end up talking about this Masachat a lot in this class. And literally it means testimony. And for many, many, uh, Scholars believe that Masachat Ejod may have been the first Masachat of Mishnah. It appears in Seder Nezikin in the, uh, it, it, you know, in one of the books, one of the six books of Mishnah. But what's interesting about it is, is that it's not around one particular topic. It's a collection of testimonies around a variety of different halachot. And some of the Mishnahs that appear in Ejod actually will appear in a different Masachat where it relates to the topic uh, that that Mishnah is speaking about. So, you know, again, so we consider this sort of to be the earliest form or the earliest Masachat of Mishnah. And so here, the Mishnah goes through a series of different machloko, different disagreements between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel. I'm not going to get into the specifics of it. It's really the end here that's important. Beit Shammai matirin et sarot lachim u Beit Hillel osrim. 
So when we're talking about rival wives, in other words, we're talking about somebody who passed away and did not, a man who passed away and didn't have children. And then there becomes a question about whether or not his wives who were left, this is an age of polygamy, now need to marry that brother in order to, uh, this is the mitzvah of Yibum, in order to carry on the deceased brother's name. So Beit Shammai allowed rival wives, allowed two sisters, Ubeit Hillel Osrin, Beit Hillel said it was not allowed. Chaltsu, Beit Shammai poslin min hakuna, Ubeit Hillel machshirin. Let's say they did chalitza, which again was that ceremony where the brother said, the alive brother said, I'm not gonna marry these two women and I'm not gonna marry the woman. And they do chalitza, which was this very interesting ceremony, which we still do today, actually. Um, it's very rarely done, but it is done where you take a shoe and they spit on it. And it's a way of sort of showing that, you know, the brother, the alive brother is not fulfilling his duty to carry on his deceased brother's name. Let's say they ended up doing chalitza. So Beit Shammai says that this woman is now pasul. She could not marry a, 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 a Kohen. Um, and Beit Hillel says they could marry a Kohen. Nitamu, Beit Shammai machshirin, u Beit Hillel poslin. Let's say they did actually this process of yibum. Then Beit Shammai says it's machshir, it's kosher. And Beit Hillel says, no, they're pasul from the kuhuna. But afal pi she and even though some of them said pasul and some of them said kosher, So what happened? They did not prevent, the, the house of Beit Shammai did not prevent the women from marrying into the house of Beit Hillel. And now remember, when they have these differences over marital law, it's a very big deal because it actually calls into questions issues of manzerus, right? Of like children who are born from a marriage or from a relationship that shouldn't have taken place. And yet, even though they had such a machlokas over this particular issue, they did not prevent each other from marrying each other's women. The kolataro b'tmeo chayu elu mitarim be'elu mitamim. And all of the things that one camp said was, was pure and the other one said was tame, right? The other, if like Beit Shammai said something was Tahor and Beit Hillel said it was Tameh, Beit Hillel would accept that Beit Shammai claimed that this was Tahor. So let's say they needed to borrow vessels from each other or Kalim from each other. They would accept it as, you know, as they said it was Tahor and they would say, okay, it was Tahor. And so here, even though the Gemara and the Yerushalmi seems to present Machlokas, as something not good, as something that happened because of a defect between the Talmidim of Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, here we have a very different view. The view of this mission in Ejot seems to say, yes, there was machlokas, but there was this beautiful, healthy respect between the two, the two, the two kito, between these two camps. And they still would marry with each other. They still would say, sure, what you say is Tahor, we'll respect as Tahor. And they still figured out a way to get along. And so this presents a very different picture of the machlokas between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. Another Mishnah here that I want to have us look at is, uh, again, what will happen with machlokas in the future. I'm a Rabbi Yeshua, mi Rabbanan Yochanan ben Zakai. So Rabbi Yeshua says that this is the following thing that he learned from his Rebbe, uh, uh, Yochanan ben Zakai. And he learned this from his Rebbe, he learned it from his Rebbe, he learned it from his Rebbe. So the idea is this is a Messorah that goes very, very far back. So what he says is, is that the tradition going all the way back from Moshe at Har Sinai is that when Eliyahu comes, meaning at the times of Mashiach, Eliyahu is not going to come to say, you were right, this was Tame, this was Tahor. What this is talking about is, is that often, especially after the time of the um, first diaspora, when there was the Shivat Zion, you can read about this in Ezra and Nehemiah, there were questions about people's yichos, right? It wasn't clear always who was actually Jewish, sometimes who was actually part of a kahuna. And so what this means is l'rachik, meaning to say that they weren't actually Jewish or they weren't part of the kahuna, or l'karev, or to say somebody mistakenly thought they weren't Jewish or part of the kahuna, and they could be brought in. 
ulakarev amecharkin bizroa. And so the only thing that this would do is either to bring people closer, right? Like it's not going to push anybody out, but um, but uh, you know it's going to try to bring uh, some people closer. Some people will be brought away. Mishpachat, and now they go through some specific examples here. Mishpachat Beit Shreifa Haita Be'Eber Hayardain. There was this Beit Shreifa family who lived in Eber Hayardain. Berechaka Ben Sion Bezroa. And then there was uh, uh, this other family that was pushed out, the Ben Sion one. Be'oda Chered Haita Sham Be'Krava Ben Sion Bezroa. And then there was another episode where this Ben Sion family was brought in. Kugon Elo. So this is what he's talking about. Okay, so this is what he's saying it, it is going to, to happen, is that basically Eliyahu is not necessarily going to come to declare these people pure or impure or to distance them or to bring them closer, but rather the people who are already distanced maybe will be brought in and those who were brought close and it was by force, okay, they will be, they will be brought out. But it's not going to just be this sort of like unilateral you're in, you're out. It's going to have to be a reason to say that somebody is lirachik. Rabbi Yehuda has a different opinion. Rabbi Yehuda Omer lekarev about lo lirachik. It would only be to bring people in, but not to send them away. And again, Rabbi Yeshua tempered it by saying it was people who were brought in by force. Rabbi Shimon Omer lihishabot hamachloket. So Rabbi Shimon has a totally different idea. He says that what that he will be there too. What does lihishabot mean? Does anybody have how they would translate that? Anyone? So it means to like resolve, to like, yeah, right. To, to basically oh, just need to resolve. equalize. Right, yeah. equalize, exactly. He will equalize all the machloket. So it will answer all the questions. You know, if there's a machloket, Eliyahu will come and say, no, this was right and this was wrong. But it's, it's said in a little bit of a nicer way. It's not so much about who's right or wrong. It will equalize it. It will sort of explain it away. And the Chachamim say no. It's not going to be about saying who was right or who was wrong, who was in or who was out. It's just going to be about bringing peace. And then they quote this pasuk from Malachi. Right, that I'm sending you, right, Eliyahu, the prophet, who will return the hearts of the fathers on the sons and the hearts of the sons and the fathers. And so the Chachamim have this very interesting opinion, which basically seems to say, Eliyahu is not here to tell us who is right or wrong. Eliyahu is here just to bring Shalom. What that exactly means, I think is up for us to think a little bit about, but it's very clear that it's different from the opinion of Rabbi Yeshua, of Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon, where there seems to be more of like a decisive nature to what will happen to this resolution of Machlokas when Eliyahu comes. Um, and uh, finally, this last mission in Ejod uh, also talks a little bit about why do we remember dissenting opinions, right? Right. So why do we remember these dissenting opinions? So the first reason is, is because teaching people that machloket existed is healthy. Because when somebody disagrees in the next generation, we can turn to them and say, look, look at Hillel and Shammai. They disagreed with each other, but yet they didn't stand on principle necessarily. They would concede. Or we could look back even, maybe it means what the Mishnah was that we learned before, right? They still figured out a way to get along with each other. They still married within each other's houses. They respected if somebody said something was tahor. And so part of the reason why we remember Machloket is to be able to say to people, yep, yeah, there's always been machlokas, but we don't stand so hard. We don't stand our ground so hard on uh, when we have a different opinion. Then the, the Mishnah asks another question. Right? Why do we remember a singular opinion amongst the majority? Because we know the halacha is going to be by the majority. So let's say there's a Beitin who sees the singular opinion and wants to rely on it. So the reason why we remember that singular opinion is so that in the future, let's say a Beitin reaches the conclusion of the Yachid and not the conclusion of the majority. 
We then can go to that Beitin and the Beitin realizes, hey, that's actually a Yachid opinion. And we're not really allowed to overturn that opinion unless we're a Beitin of equal size of that previous Beitin and also greater in wisdom. Let's say it was greater in wisdom, but not a number. Remember that the Batei Din had different numbers. There could be one of three, 23, or 71. The minyan of alo bechachma, or let's say it was greater in number, um, but not in wisdom. They can't, you, you, you can't undo what a previous can't undo what a previous Beitei Din so the reason here is to basically keep the opinion of the Yachid so that the Beitim would know that they were following an opinion of a Yachid and then they would have to figure out, is it appropriate for them? Can they actually rely on it as long as they're bigger in number and in wisdom? And finally, and I love this, Rabbi Yehuda comes and disagrees with this. So we have like a singular opinion in our discussion of Machlokas, right? I'm a Rabbi Yehuda. Im kein lama maskirin divreya Yachid ben hamerabin levatela. And so Rabbi Yehuda has a very different idea, which is he says that if somebody says, this is the Mesorah that I got, in other words, they're insistent, insistent, insistent on their dat yachid, right, on their singular opinion, we can say to them, uh, we can say to them, no, your forefathers were not insistent on their opinion. It was a dat yachid and they still went with the majority. So, you know, I wanted to do this series of Mishnayot in Masachat Ejod, um, because it's interesting to see these Mishnas really talk about Machloket uh, very upfront. And so, first of all, they present a very different version of the Machloket of Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, which is different than Yerushalmi, that yes, they had Machloket, maybe it wasn't a bad thing, they still figured out how to get along with each other, right? Uh, and then we saw, you know, why is it that we were, um, how will these things be resolved? in the time of Mashiach, and the Chachamim basically say it won't be resolved, we'll just have some type of magical peace. And finally, what is the reason to maintain Machloket? In other words, why do we record Machloket? And that we see already the Mishnah by design shows that recording Machloket is actually a value. It actually serves purpose. Finally, I want to go to this beautiful Gemara, which really I think is actually my favorite Gemara that I've ever learned. And it's a Gemara in Masechad Eruven. Um, and please pay close attention to who says this. Um, and so, oh, sorry, no, I want to get, that's the Gemara in, in Chagiga, excuse me. So we have this other Gemara in Eruven, uh, which says the following, Amar Rabbi Abba, Amar Shmuel, Shlo Shanim Nachlaku Beit Shammai or Beit Hillel. So they talk about it for three years, Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel disagreed with each other. Halalu Omrim Halacha Kamotenu, but Halalu Omrim Halacha Kamotenu. One group would say the Halacha is like us, one group would say the Halacha is like us. So this is a very famous Gemara, right? A bakol comes out. So a bakol is always some type of divine, divine voice that comes out and sort of resolves an argument that humans would not be able to resolve themselves, right? You would need some type of divine intervention. And so he says, and this first half is very, very famous, right? Both of these are the words of God. Both of these are the words of Torah. Everybody quotes that part. But what's the second half of what the uh, Bat Kol says? But the Halacha is still Kabeit Hello. So in other words, the Bat Kol is saying, yes, both of these can be words of Torah, right? You can have Machloket, and it doesn't mean one is right or one is wrong. Rather, the real question is, who do we paskin like? Who do we follow with the Halacha? And we follow like Beit Hello. So then the Gemara asks that question. Wait, the Bat Kol just came out and said, So then why does Beit Hillel have the Zuchut that the, the Halacha goes according to Beit Hillel? Right? So we learn a very interesting uh, character trait of Beit Hillel. And Beit Hillel, what did they do? They were kind and gracious. And also they would always, when they taught their ideas, right? They would teach also the ideas of Beit Shammai. And not only that, they would teach the ideas of Beit Shammai first. And so what we're starting to see here for the first time is that yes, you can have machlokas, but there's a way to be respectful within your machlokas. And what this bat call was saying with this statement is, is that ultimately it was Beit Hillel who showed these particular type of character traits, 
right? Of being able to be kind, of teaching the, your opponent's opinion, of not only teaching your opponent's opinion, but teaching it first, that ultimately allowed that the halacha would follow Hillel. And it's interesting, again, to see the Bakol is not criticizing that there's machloket, but rather is praising, right? The one who was able to really teach and learn the other side's opinions. And we most beautifully see this, and this is my favorite Gemara, excuse me, this Gemara in Chagiga. So this Gemara in Chagiga is discussing the following pasuk. It's a pasuk in Kohelet that reads as follows, and it's a very strange pasuk. The words of the wise are like goats, like cattle prods, right? It's like a stick that makes the cow sort of stay where it's supposed to stay. And as nails well fastened are those composed in collections and they are given from one shepherd. And so the Gemara here wants to understand what exactly is this Pasuk referring to? So these ba'alei asufot, these collections, are the talmidei chachamim. Sheyoshfin asufot asufot, who sit in groups and groups, boskim b'torah, right? And they're busy with Torah. Halulu mitamim, halulu mitaharin. Some will say that something is tame, and some will say that something is tahor. Halulu osrim, halulu matirin. Some will say that something is not allowed, and some group will say something is for, is permitted. Halulu poslin, halulu machshirin. One group will say something is pasul, it's not kosher, and the other group will say it's kosher. Shama yomar adam, heichani lama Torah, me'ata tamud lamar, kulam net echad. Okay? So a person could sit in the Beit Midrash, basically. Here's this multitude of opinions and basically says, heichani lama Torah. How is it possible for me to learn Torah? I can't ever come to a conclusive truth about anything because one group is saying Tame, one group is saying Tahor, one group is saying Asur, one group is saying ma- Mutar, one group is saying Pasul, one group is saying Kosher. It's confusing, right? It's too much. How do we learn? And so the rest of that Pasuk says, right, Miro Echad, right? That it comes, that it's all from, uh, from one shepherd, right? Kel Echad, Nan Parnes Echad, right? So one God, right, gave it, right? Amran, mi pi adon kol hamasim, right? So the ro'eh achad is referring to who? It's referring to Moshe Rabbeinu. And so the idea here is that there's one leader who says this, who heard everything from uh, the mouth of God. And so the point here is that, yes, there's machlokas, but everything started at one point. Everything started from the point of Moshe Rabbeinu hearing this from Hashem. And so, yes, there's machlokas in later generations, but what you need to focus on is the ro'eh achad. It's one. It's one teacher. It originates from one teacher, from hearing it from the singular voice of God. And I think here there's also an idea of the unity, right? Like we firmly believe that's what monotheism is, of one God. And so, therefore, we're describing the Torah in similar words of this concept of, um, of, of achad, right? And dikhtiv, Right, so then this is again a pasuk from Shmot chapter 20, where it's talking about Matan Torah, where it says, Hashem spoke kol hadavarim ha'ela, right? And now this is my favorite part of this Gemara. Afata aseh. So look at the Gemara, it's talking to us, to each of us. So this is what you should do. Aseh oznecha ka'afar sechet. So you should make your ear like a sieve, basically. The kanelacha laid me vin lishmoa. And you need to acquire for yourself a heart that understands how to listen. And so, what I always like to think this is, is that this is actually the practice of radical empathy, right? It's the idea of being able to listen to somebody who greatly disagrees with you, but you have practiced a kanelacha laid laha vin lishmoa. This is an emotional thing that we have to work on. It's not about just listening, we can listen to anybody. But it's the idea that we can listen to somebody who vehemently disagrees with us, right? And emotionally, we can be open to it, right? We can really, really listen. We can listen to what's tame and to what's tahor. And so who is the person who actually said this? Rabbi Yeshua is the person who's quoting this whole Gemara, and this will be important later on. 
And this is a teaching of Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah. And we'll talk in a little bit about who Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah is and why it's so important that he makes the statement. And that basically Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, right? Any generation that he was in was not considered to be an orphan generation. And so this beautiful statement of Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah is essentially giving us the key of how to deal with machloket. It's not that machloket is going to be resolved, but it's that each of us needs to develop this character trait of how can we do radical empathic listening? How can we listen to somebody who has an opinion that's exactly opposite ours? And yet we can still be open to listening it. We're like a sieve, we can take everything in, we'll trickle out what the halacha is going to be, but we're open to everything. And I think, and I, you know, it's not a far stretch to say that I think in our highly politicized times, this is certainly a character trait that I think is slowly getting um, more and more lost over a host of different issues. And so what I want to conclude with is to go through a beautiful story that appears in the Gemara in Masachat Brachot that I think actually demonstrates all of this, that really demonstrates this idea of Kanelecha Lev Lahabin Lishmoa. And as a side point to this, um, one of my philosophies, which I learned um, very much so from my father, um, Michael Osben, is that if you don't understand who the people are, the Tanaim and Amurayim, all of these different stories inform each other. And so as we learn this Gemar and Brachot, and it's going to be about Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, if you don't under know this Gemara in Chagiga, this story doesn't take on as much meaning. But once you understand the story in Chagiga, this story feels totally and can be understood um, very, very differently. Before I get to that, I'm just going to look at it and see if there are any uh, questions here. Um, so Mitch wrote, you know, could one make an argument that the first Machlochet L'Shem Shamayim comes with Chanukah Mishkan after the deaths of Nadav and Aviyu between Moshe and Aaron, where Moshe questions Aaron's handling of the Korbanot. But we see Aaron giving an answer and the Vasuk family says, Vayishma Moshe Vayitab Ve'enav. So yeah, that's a good question. We don't, I haven't seen a source for that, but yes, we do see that there's sort of a machlokas there. And we do see times in the Torah where Moshe may be unsure of a halacha or needs to go back. It's not always so straightforward, right? Like Benot Slavchad, he wasn't quite sure what to do. So even in those times, we see that sometimes Moshe needs to go ahead um, and, and seek an, an answer. Okay, Noah thinks it's very meta, an individual opinion about why individual opinions are preserved. I agree, that's what I love about Rabbi Yehuda's opinion there. Um, and um, yes, you brought up another Mishnah that's in Edra, which I did not include about Akavia ben Mahalalel, who gave up his position of authority because he held very firmly on a dat yachid. Um, and he basically tells his son to go with the Rabbeim um, because there was a clear majority. Yes, I did not quote that one just for the sake of time. So it shows, you know, how this, he basically shows his son not to follow um, in, in his, uh, in his footsteps, exactly. Um, yes, I will make Murray Macomode available. Um, and I, right, and I like this also where you see, you know, often we have arguments where people say Elu Ve'elu, right? Um, but I always think it's interesting, we still don't acknowledge the second half of that statement, which gave a definitive Pesach Halacha. So we can say Elu Ve'elu as much as we want, but at the end of the day, it says Halacha Kibet Hillel. But I think the important point of that is not so much that it's definitive, it's kind of looking at the motivations or the kindness of what which opinion is more kind or who's the person who's more kind. And that's actually how you're supposed to get your Psaq Halacha, which I think is a very different way than how I think we often think of how we get to Psaq Halacha. Okay, so now let's get to this great story. Masa b'talmid achad shabali p'nei Rabbi Yeshua. So there was an incident where a student came in front of Rabbi Yeshua. And many Mepharshim explain that actually the student may have been um, uh, 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 Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, which is very interesting because he's sort of known to be a little bit of a harif, you know, uh, personality. So I think just keep that in mind, right? He's the one who was like in a cave for 12 years and then came out of the cave and was burning everything that he looked at and Hashem sent him back to the, to the cave um, because he sort of is very staunch in his opinions. So this Talmud comes to Rabbi Yeshua. Amar le tefilat arvid reshut zarchova. Is davening marev at night, is it, a, is it, you know, something you maybe have to do? You know, maybe you can do, you know, it's not a have to, or is it an obligation? Amar le reshut. And Rabbi Yeshua answers, it's a reshut. Ba'alif ne Rabban Gamliel. So now he comes before Rabban Gamliel. So this is Rabban Gamliel II. 
So just as a little background here, Rebbe Gamliel II is the Nasi, right? He is the head of the Jewish people when we are after the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash. And for the first time, the epicenter of Torah is actually in Yavna. It's not in Yerushalayim. And a lot of what Rebbe Gamliel needs to do is he wants to solidify the Nasi and Torah as coming out of Yavna and that there's really only one leader and one Pesach Halacha. So they come now, the student to Rebbe Gamliel and ask the same question, right? Amar lei tefilat arvid reshut yochava, amar lei chava. And Rebbe Gamliel II, as the Nasi, as the head of the Beit Din, what does he say? He says, it's a chava. Amar lei, and now the student instigates, and he says, v'halo Rebbe Yeshua amar li reshut. Rebbe Yeshua said to me that what? It's actually not an obligation. So he's sort of letting Rebbe Gamliel know, just so you know, in your own Beit Midrash, there's a machloket over this. Amar le hitim achi nasu ba le trisin le beit hamidrash. So Rabban Gamliel says to him, wait until the shield bearers, okay, that's a description of the um, uh, of the tamidei chachamim, but notice it's a very sort of uh, defensive military type of, right? Like Rabban Gamliel is in the middle of a war, okay? Come to the beit midrash. Kishenich nasu ba le trisin amad hashoel b'shel al tefilat zarvit reshut ochova. So the students come into the Beit Midrash and the Shoel, right? There was a person who would present the question and then the rabbis would discuss it. And so the question, which Rabbi Gamliel obviously planted, is, is Tefilat Zarvit Rashut or Chova? And so what does he answer here? Amar le Rabbi Gamliel, Chova, right? And so Rabbi Gamliel says, it's a Chova. Amar lehen Rabbi Gamliel, Chachachamim. And then Rabbi Gamliel turns to the Chachamim and says, Klum yesh adam shecholek b'davar zeh? So he says, is there anybody here who disagrees with me? He wants to know. He's trying to out Rabbi Yoshua, okay? Amar le Rabbi Yoshua, love. Rabbi Yoshua is like, no, not me. <laughs> I don't know who you're talking about. Amar le, he says, v'halo mishmech amru li reshut. I heard in your name that you said it's a reshut. Amar le, Yoshua, Amar le, so Rabbi Gamliel says, Yoshua, amud araglecha, stand on your feet. Now, again, What's also interesting about this is that we know that testimony always had to be done standing up. So in a way, he's sort of forcing Rabbi Yeshua to sort of testify in front of the baby trash, the Ya'idu Bach, right, and we will testify in front of you. In other words, we're going to teach you the real halakha. Amar Rabbi Yeshua al-Raglav, so Rabbi Yeshua stands up, the Amar al-Malei ani chai v'humet yachol achai l'achhi shatamet. So he says, look, if I was living and he was dead, meaning the student who outed him, right, I could pretend that the dead person didn't say this. But the fact that I'm alive and he's alive, how can I deny what the living is saying? So Rabbi Shu is basically saying, you got me. You're right. I said it. So Rabbi Gamliel continues with the lecture. Remember, Rabbi Yoshua is standing up. But Rabbi Yoshua made our glove. At Sharananu Kol Ha'am. The Amu, all right, and then the whole nation, notice the description here, starts to murmur. And they say to Chutzpit the Torgaman, right? Chutzpit was the one who would sort of repeat what was being said afterwards. He appears in many places in the Gemara, um, um, right? So they say, Amud, right? They're like, what's going on here? This isn't okay. They know that Rabbi Yeshua is being disrespected. Imri ad kama na'atsenu. How much is, is Rabbi Gamliel going to, um, is going to sort of bother or, you know, pick on uh, Rabbi Yeshua, right? And now they're going to give a series of uh, examples where Rabbi Gamliel seemed to disagree with Rabbi Yeshua. The Nazil Rosh Hashanah, right? All right, the Masa Rabbi Tzadok Tzareha, Hachanami Tzareha. So we have three cases where he bothered him. The first one was with Rosh Hashanah. So this is also a very famous Gemara that appears in Masach Yuma, which is that Rabbi Yoshua and Rabbi Gamliel disagreed about the date of Tishrei, when Tishrei started, and therefore they disagreed about the date of Yom Kippur. And Rabbi, Yush, Rabbi Gamliel felt Yud, right? Yud uh, Tishrei was one day. Rabbi, Rabbi Yoshua, it fell out on Rabbi Gamliel's Yud Aleph. And so what Rabbi Gamliel did was, is he made Rabbi Yoshua appear before him with his staff and a wallet full of money on the day that Rabbi Yeshua believed was actually Yom Kippur. And he made them do that publicly. Another machlokas they had was over the Bechorot. 
So we know that a firstborn animal needed to be given to the Kohanim. If it got a moon, if it got some sort of blemish, right, then the Kohen could sort of use it for personal use and it wouldn't be given as an actual korban. So what started to happen is some not good Kohanim, we know that this was a, a problem in the second Beit HaMikdash, in the second temple time, they maybe purposefully blemished the animals. And so they made a psak that if an animal was found with a blemish, the Kohen couldn't use it. But there was a question about Rabbi Tzedek. Rabbi Tzedek was a very holy uh, Kohen. And Rabbi Yeshua said, if Rabbi Tzedek finds a blemish, we'll allow it, right? Rabbi Tzedek then will we'll, we'll trust him that he actually found it. Rabbi Gamliel disagreed with it. And then here's the third case with this issue about Mariv and is it Rashut or if it's, or if it is Chova. So what do they say? Tovina Avrena, Aman, no Kimla, no Kima, right? So what do they say? Sorry. So they said, Tovina Avrena, let's remove Rabbi Gamliel. Rabbi Gamliel is picking on Rabbi Yeshua so much that the masses basically come and what do they say? He can no longer be the Nasi. He can no longer be in charge. Okay. So, okay, maybe we should put in charge Rabbi Yoshua. We can't put Rabbi Yoshua in charge. Why? Because he's the one who has the machlokas with him. So it look, then it would look like Rabbi Yoshua wanted this position of power. Okay? Then it says, no kima le Rabbi Akiva. Right? So they said, okay, maybe we could uh, appoint instead Rabbi Akiva. Right? Dilma Anishle. No, Rabbi Gamliel is going to be able to sort of punish him or, or bother him, right? The Lesle Zechut vote because we know that Rabbi Akiva didn't come from good, uh, he didn't come from good yichus, right? He didn't come from a, from, a, a, from a strong family. So that's why they don't want to use him. Ella Nukame le Rabbi Elezer ben Azariah. Uh, so now we have our friend Rabbi Elezer ben Azariah from Kanel Chalev Lavin Lishmoa. And they said, let's appoint him. Duhu Chacham, he's wise. Vuhu Ashir, and he's wealthy. Right and v'hu v'hu Ashsiri le Ezra and he is a tenth generation from Ezra Hasopher. So he has wisdom. He has wealth. And remember, part of the reason why wealth was important is they would sometimes have to give money to gifts to to Rome. Okay, um, and um, and also he comes from a good family. He come he comes from the family of Ezra. Hu chacham di makishle mafrikle. Right that if we know he's a wise, that if he, you know, if there's a kasha, if there's a machlokas, he'll be able to figure out the answer. Right? Right? That if there's a present that he's rich, there's a present that needs to be given to the Caesar, he would be able to give it. And the fact that he's 10th generation from Ezra, he has, he has good yichus, he has the chutavot. Right? Um, and Rabbi Gamliel basically can't hold anything against him. There's nothing he could do to say that he is not uh, deserving uh, deserving of this. Atuv Amrule, right? And so they said to him, okay, they, they present this plan to Rabbi Elezer ben Azaria, right? But Amrule, and he says some Nihule Lamar Dilhu Reish Mitvata. So he basically says, um, he says, okay, I got to think about this. Amar Luhu Azil Vim, sorry, they say to him, you'll be the head of the baby drash. Amar Luhu Azil Vim Lech Banchi Beiti. So he says, okay, I got to think about this. I got to go home to my wife and talk about Azil Vamlich Bidavatehu, right? So he goes and talks about it with his wife. Amar Leh, his wife says to him, right? Dilma Ma Birin Lach, she says, okay, maybe they'll get rid of you next, right? Just as easily as they got rid of Rabban Gamliel, they could get rid of you next. Amar La, Right, Yomachara Bikisei de Mukra Ulumacha Le Yatfer. So he basically says to them, I'd rather be in this position of this chair for one day. And if it gets taken from me, take it from me. In other words, he recognizes it may be temporary and that's okay. Amarle, Lesle Chiyorta. She says, You don't have um, gray hair. And so this is the very famous Rabbi Elizabeth and Azariah from the Haggadah. We'll get to this. Right, Hahu Yoma Bart uh, Tamne Sari. Shani, right? He was 18 years old on this day. Have et rachishle nisa, a miracle happened for him. Bahadra ulet tame sari dari chiyurta. And he grows 18 sort of rows of gray hair. And so that's why when Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria says in the Haggadah, Harayani kiven shivim shana, I'm like I'm 70. It's referring to this because he wasn't actually old. He was actually young, but he looked like he was 70 years old. Uh, old, right? Uh, right? 
Lo ben shivim shana, right? He wasn't actually 70 years old, okay? So he basically, he agrees to go ahead and he says, okay, I'm now going to be the nasi. I will replace Rabban Gamliel after this back and forth with his wife. So what happens, okay? Um, Tana, Otoha Yom. So they taught on that day, meaning on that day, the Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria becomes the nasi, becomes the head of the Beit Midrash. Sakuhu lishmor hapetach. They got rid of the what? There used to be like a guard, like a bouncer, basically, in front of the Beit Midrash. And they got rid of him. He allowed that every anybody who wanted to come and learn who could learn because Rabban Gamliel would stand at the front and he would say, any Talmi who's outside, right, who's inside is not like his outside, is not allowed to come to the baby Josh. So Rabban Gamliel did not allow everybody to come and learn Torah. Hahu Yoma Atsufu Kama Safsale. On that day, how many benches needed to be added to the Beit Midrash? Amar Rabbi Yochanan. So, of course, they have a machlokas about this. Pligiba Ava Yosef ben Duste for Rabbanan. So, machlokas between Ava Yosef and Rabbanan. Chadamar Atsufu Arba Mea Safsale, Vachadamar Sheba Mea Safsale. Right? One says there were 400 benches added, one says 700. But the point is, is that hundreds, if not thousands, of students right, now enter the Beit Midrash for the first time when Rabbi Elezer ben Azaria becomes in charge, right? Rabbi Gamliel sees this and he becomes depressed, basically. Amar, Dilma chas v'shalom minaniti Torah mi Yisrael. God forbid, chas v'shalom, I prevented Torah in Yisrael, right? He thought he was doing the right thing. And now he sees once the Beit Midrash is open to anybody who wants access, hundreds of more students came. And now he's very depressed. Maybe he did the wrong thing. So he is given a dream. And what's the dream? There are these white vases that are filled with dust, right? And so the idea is supposed to be like, yes, all of these students are coming. They look like nice little white vases, but inside, what are they filled with? They're not really filled with anything. But then the Gemara goes on to say, Belohi hahi liutve date. This only appeared for him just to appease his thought, right? In other words, no, these people were actually really deserving to be there, right? Um, okay, and now they go on to say, uh, Tana, okay? So now we learn, Ejot Bo Bayom Nishne. On this day that the Beit Midrash was open to everybody, what was taught for the first time? Masachet Ejot. Masachet Ejot, we say, was written on this day. On this day, when the Beit Midrash was finally was open to a multitude of students, we could finally, for the first time, sort of write or um, assemble Mishnah, and not only assemble Mishnah, but we're assembling Mishnah that specifically revolves around the topic of what? Of Machloket. Mishnah that really is willing to commemorate or to record a multitude of, of, of opinions. And the call echad amrim bo bayom. Anywhere where you see that it says bo bayom, hahu yomahave. It's talking about this day, this day when Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria becomes the nasi. This day where finally all of these students came, and what was allowed to happen? Finally, masachet edjot. We had the ability to really teach Torah, right? And then it finally says belo haita halacha shaita tuliyab beit hamidrash. There was no halacha that was sort of waiting in suspension. There was nothing that was left unresolved. Shalom Perushel that was not able to be explained. But Af Rabban Gamliel, Loma Nat, Smomi Beit Hamidrash, and even Rabban Gamliel did not exclude himself from the Beit Midrash, Afil Sha'at Achad, even one hour. So this is a beautiful Gemara that I think really illustrates the power of Machloket. And again, it's important that it's Rabbi Elezer ben Azaria. We had Rabban Gamliel, who was the Nasi, who really tried to force everybody to only abide by his opinions. And when he comes out finally too strong against Rabbi Yoshua, the people start to rebel and they say, no, he's not treating Rabbi Yoshua respectfully. So they finally appoint Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria. And again, I think it's significant that this is the same Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria who says he knows that when you sit in the Beit Midrash, you're going to hear a multitude of opinions like he explains in the Gemara of Chagiga. But he's the Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria who understands this practice of listening empathically, right? Of kanelacha 
Lev lehabin lishmoa. And then finally, the Gemara here concludes, right, based on all of that, that what happens? Yes, we can have, you know, the Bay Midrash, it finally opens. It's open to a multitude of opinions. And what happens? Torah even increases that day. You have more students, you have more opinions, right? And then the Gemara, I think, wants to be very clear that yes, Masachat Ejot is sort of collected on that day, which has plenty of machloket in it. But the point here is that once you open yourself to being able to hear a difference of opinion, what happens? No halacha is left in suspension. Everything will actually be resolved and everything can actually be explained. And so what I want to conclude here with is that I think, and I just, I'm at 7.59. So <laughs> what I want to conclude here with is that I think you know, this, this Gemara and Chagiga and Brachot, I think really gives us a beautiful approach to the role of Machloket. That yes, we have this Gemara in the Yerushalmi that says maybe Machloket happened because it wasn't necessarily uh, some good practices of the students of, you know, Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel. But ultimately, I think what the Bavli expresses is, is that if we have, ma if we are able not to focus on the Machloket, but more can be Kanelecha Lev Lahabin Lishmoa, that we can exercise this midah, develop this midah, this character trait, where we have hearts that are open to listening, right? Then that's totally different. And not only is that, we see it illustrated with the story with Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria, that actually Torah flourishes, Torah is increased when we have a Beit Midrash that is open to machloket, and we can also do radical listening and empathic listening as well in that context of the Beit Midrash. So thank you so much. I'll open it up to questions. I'll put, I'll send you the source sheet. Ah, I fell for the oldest trick in the book. I forgot to unmute myself before I started oh. talking. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like getting put, stuck in a land war in China, in China, if you know what I mean. Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, Mitch, uh, you had... Uh, another question I think that you put into the chat. Do you want to unmute and uh, raise that question? If others have questions, please feel free to put it into the chat or let me know and we, we can try to uh, recognize it. Sure. And, and I guess that is a really excellent uh, presentation. So thank you very much, Dr. Osban. Um, I'm curious about the viability of Machloke L'Shem Shemayim. And you, you even see it today where um, if a tshuva or position comes from one group, um, it, it may be debated more seriously within a certain circle um, or it may be rejected based on its affiliation. So for instance, um, there's a very lengthy tshuva that came out in the conservative movement on Zoom during the, the height of COVID. It was, it was a substantial position that one could agree or disagree or even parse it. Um, but within the, in much of the Orthodox world, it was never even considered, right? And Vice versa, you take that with a lot of things. In different circles, I, one, one group issues a position, it's readily dismissed as opposed to the, the argument. And what, where does that fit into this conversation of machloket? And also, what is it? Let's call him that meble mishamar. The Roman talks about wherever, follow the, the quality of the argument, regardless of who says it. Right. So I look, I, I think that's really a huge issue. And I think when we learn these passages, I think what we learn, the Tanayim had vehemently, uh, you know, they, Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua disagreed about the date of Yom Kippur. And ultimately, Rabbi Gamliel gets removed because he was disrespectful to Rabbi Yeshua. Now, I should just, you know, end that story with eventually, Rabbi Gamliel does get reinstated and he shares the position with Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria. So I, I just want to say that is the actual end of the story. But yeah, I don't, I, I think this dismissiveness and the type of attacking that goes on, particularly in let's say more right-wing orthodoxy, I don't think it's really reflective of how the Tanaim and Amorayim dealt with each other. And I certainly don't think it's the value of Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria. Um, and even that Gemara that talks about, in, you know, a Reuben of Elu Ve'elu Divrei Elohim Chaim, it's very clear that, that the reason why we follow Hillel is not because of the logic of his argument. I think that's what we always say that, you know, Hillel's more Mekel, Shammai was more Machmir. No, it's really that Hillel was willing to teach Shammai and had a totally different approach to things in life. And he's credited for that by the Halacha always following Hillel. 
Thank you. Okay, if there, there are no other questions, I think that's really an excellent uh, note to uh, end our pre presentation with. And once again, uh, thank you uh, to Dr. Uh, Osband for her presentation. Uh, let me uh, just make a couple of closing notes. First of all, thank you again to our sponsors. I put the name of the sponsors into uh, the chat. Um, and uh, we also have uh, the, the third of this series of uh, webinars was scheduled for next Monday, but we are going to reschedule that and please stay tuned to the date. Uh, anyone who is registered for this program, you will get emails uh, about that. We also have a webinar uh, titled Exploring Jewish uh, Traditional Jewish Perspectives on Physician Assisted Death, a case study with Rabbi Dr. David Novak and Rabbi Dr. Lila Kashtan uh, this Thursday at 10 a.m. and a pre-Yom Kippur class uh, with Rabbi Stephen Sachs titled Making Up with Dearly Departed Ones. How do Jewish views on life after death affect the way we approach Yom Kippur, which will be on Monday, September 13th at 7 p.m. And I did put into the chat the link where you can uh, sign up for those uh, programs and uh, watch out for other programs. Thank you once again to everyone for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you uh, at the next webinar.